Hello. In this presentation, I will be discussing the metadata schema known as Dublin Core. I will be focusing first on the history and development of Dublin Core, highlighting some of the key actors and institutions which have been central to Dublin Core's success. I will also be examining some of the basic features or elements of this schema. I will take a look at real-world applications of Dublin Core, and finally, I will consider its strengths as well as weaknesses. The idea for Dublin Core was first conceived at the second international World Wide Web meeting in 1994. Over the course of the meeting, a group of technology professionals gathered to discuss a growing problem. With the rapid expansion of the internet, online resources were becoming increasingly difficult to locate. This group included Joseph Harden, a leader of the software development team at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, or NCSA. Yuri Rubinsky, who founded SoftQuad and is credited with popularizing SGML, the precursor to XML. Terry Noreau, the director of the Online Computer Library Center, OCLC, Office of Research, and two colleagues at the Office of Research, Stuart Weibel and Eric Miller. The question they posed would have lasting significance for the world of metadata. Might there be a simpler alternative for describing web assets that does not require the experience of expert catalogers? Together, Eric Miller and Stuart Weibel set out to answer this question and the OCLC NCSA Metadata Workshop was born. Taking place in March 1995, 52 people attended the two and a half day workshop, including content specialists, internet technologists, and librarians, or as Weibel put it, the freaks, the geeks, and the people with sensible shoes. The group focused on developing a new method of resource description suitable for the internet, with the goal to, quote, give people, authors, website managers, content providers, a set of common descriptive metadata elements for describing electronic assets on the web, and ultimately to enhance discoverability of online resources. From this workshop, Dublin Core was born. Taking its name from Dublin, Ohio, the location of the first workshop and headquarters of OCLC, Dublin Core was initially conceived as a set of 13 metadata elements, which I'll return to later in the presentation. Balancing practicality and complexity, the 13 elements were intended to be helpful even to untrained users. They were developed through bottom-up consensus building, something that, according to Stuart Weibel, would remain an essential attribute of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, or DCMI. Importantly, out of this meeting, a series of principles were developed to guide the evolution of Dublin Core elements. These included intrinsicality, that an element should only describe one thing, extensibility, or that an element can be easily expanded, syntax independence, that an element's syntax and semantics are separate, optionality, meaning that only necessary elements are used, repeatability, that elements can be used as many times as necessary, and modifiability, meaning that elements can be ref refined with better descriptions. Following this first meeting were a series of additional workshops which, were further invest which further investigated and built on the ideas of Dublin Core. A metadata workshop held at the University of Warwick led to the Warwick Framework, a, quote, conceptual architecture for metadata that recognized the requirement for modular, extensible metadata. The third DC workshop, co-sponsored by the OCLC and the CNI, or Coalition for Networked Information, sought primarily to answer the question, can a simple DC element set be used effectively to describe images? In order to effectively address images, two elements were added to the original Dublin Core, rights and description. 
As Australia began developing a government metadata standard based on Dublin Core, the fourth DCMI workshop took place in Canberra. Importantly, two principles for refining elements emerged from this workshop, the dumbed-down principle and the one-to-one -one principle. The dumbed-down principle suggested that applications that lacked knowledge of a given refinement could simply ignore them, while the one-to-one -one principle stated that any Dublin Core record should only describe one manifestation or, re or version of a resource. After these early meetings, the DCMI continued to hold workshops and elaborate on its initial element set. The fifth workshop in Helsinki, Finland, discussed the potential applications of the Resource Description Framework, RDF, while the sixth workshop at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC, continued this discussion. Additional workshops took place in Frankfurt, Germany in 1999 and Ottawa, Canada in 2000. In 2001, the DCMI came of age, as it were, transitioning from the small, informal workshops of previous years to full-fledged conferences taking place around the world, from Tokyo to Madrid to Berlin. DCMI was reorganized to reflect the growing importance of the initiative. With the addition of a board of trustees, a DCMI directorate, a usage board comprised of experts to guide proposed changes to Dublin Core, an affiliate program of sponsors in various countries to promote DCMI, and an advisory board to provide consultation. Meanwhile, the purpose of the group shifted from, quote, a standards creation activity to a standards maintenance activity. As a result, more emphasis came to be placed on sharing Dublin Core practices through tutorials, lectures, and conferences. Throughout these conferences, Dublin Core continued to evolve as the DCMI took on the leading issues of metadata, such as the semantic web, linked data, and interoperability among systems. Today, over two decades since its creation, Dublin Core is one of the best known and most widespread metadata initiatives. There are 15 elements which make up the Dublin Core metadata element set known also simply as the Dublin Core. These include the 13 terms developed during the OCLC NCSA metadata workshop and the two elements, rights and description, that were added at the third Dublin Core workshop. Contributor is defined by the DCMI as an entity responsible for making contributions to the resource. This could be a person, an organization, or a service. Guidelines for creator names also apply to contributors. Coverage is the spatial or temporal topic of the resource, spatial applicability of the resource, or jurisdiction under which the resource is relevant. In other words, coverage can refer to a geographic location or a period, date, or date range. DCMI recommends using a controlled vocabulary like the Getty Thesaurus of geographic names when identifying coverage. Creator refers to an entity responsible for making the resource. Like contributor, this could be a person, organization, or service. DCMI suggests identifying the creator with a URI, or a uniform resource identifier, if possible. Date is a point or period of time associated with an event in the life cycle of the resource. The date can be as specific or as broad as necessary. If complete information for the date isn't available, it's okay to include simply the month and year, or just the year. DCMI recommends following ISO standards for the format of the date. Description is defined simply as an account of the resource. This might include an abstract, a table of contents, or some other representation of the resource. Format refers to the file format, physical medium, or dimensions of the resource. DCMI suggests following a controlled vocabulary if possible. Size and duration would be two examples of dimension. Identifier is an um, unambiguous reference to the resource within a given context. DCMI suggests using a unique string, such as an international standard book number, ISBN, digital object identifier, DOI, or uniform resource name, URN. 
language is simply a language of the resource. In naming the language, it's recommended to follow either a controlled vocabulary or use an IETF Best Current Practice 47 language tag. Publisher is defined by DCMI as an entity responsible for making the resource available. Like creator or contributor, publisher can refer to a person, organization, or service. Occasionally, it can be difficult to determine who the label publisher refers to. In the case of, for example, a digital object, following the one-to-one -one principle, the publisher should be the party making the digital object available, and not the publisher of the physical object portrayed by the di di digital object. Relation is a related resource. DCMI recommends identifying the resource with a URI if available. Rights refers to information about rights held in and over the resource. This might include a statement about, for example, intellectual property rights associated with the resource. Source is defined as a related resource from which the described resource is derived. The source can be derived completely or only partly from the related resource and should be identified with a URI or string. Subject is a topic of the resource. DCMI recommends the subject be part of a controlled vocabulary and referred to with a URI. Title is described by DCMI as a name given to the resource. Finally, type is the nature or genre of the resource. DCMI recommends using a controlled vocabulary like the DCMI type vocabulary for this purpose. In addition to these original 15 terms, or the Dublin Core, there are now a number of extension vocabularies. These include properties, classes, data types, and vocabulary encoding schemes. Properties, uh, formerly elements in Dublin Core, are the main attributes of resources and allow for uniform structured resource description. Class, classes group resources with common properties. Typically, classes are defined by DCMI type vocabularies. Data types are rules that determine how certain information is structured and may be employed for dates, types, or formats. And vocabulary encoding schemes, originally called concept schemes, are used to structure information and properties, including creator, contributor, and subject. The Dublin Core, combined with these extension vocabularies, is referred to as DCMI metadata terms. In order to make the terms suitable for linked data, they're expressed in RDF vocabularies, but they can also be used with XML, JSON, UML, or relational databases. To further enable Dublin Core applications in linked data, every DCMI term is matched to Uniform Resource Identifier, or URI. By visiting the DCMI metadata terms page on Dublin Core's website, users can view a list of DCMI terms and properties. In 2002, Carolyn Guinchard conducted a survey on the use of Dublin Core in libraries. Her results shed light on how Dublin Core was received and implemented during its formative years. The large majority of respondents to Gwinchard's survey came from university libraries in the USA, Australia, and Germany. The reasons that respondents gave for adopting Dublin Core included international acceptance, flexibility, interoperability for the future, ease of application, familiarity to the library community, and support by the local system search engine. Here are some of the ways Dublin Core was implemented in libraries. First is a subject gateway. This refers primarily to web portal projects, often with a specific research focus, typically directed towards electronic resources. Management of electronic publications, such as theses and dissertations. This relies on certain functions enabled by Dublin Core, for example, preserving, gathering, and exchanging electronic publications. Some other implement implementation examples include as digitized historical resources for selected web resource management, embedding metadata in library web pages, uh, intermedi intermediary scheme for other types of metadata exchange among repositories, 
enhancing access to film and video collections, current awareness service for electronic table of contents for journal articles and conference papers, and developing archiving and rights management metadata prototypes. Survey respondents reported using a variety of tools to implement Dublin Core, including Microsoft Access, Allegro, Oracle, and OCLC Site Search, as well as specific search engines like UltraSeq, Verity, Query Server, and Cheshire. A decade after Gwynchard's survey in 2012, Tyler Phelps released a paper evaluating the implementation of Dublin Core in web based resources. Surveying an assortment of 236 websites, including National Library homepages, Phelps sought to address two hypotheses. First, that contemporary websites would tend not to include metadata of any kind within source code, in line with the results of previous studies. Second, Phelps hypothesized that Dublin Core element use in websites would continue to be rare. Phelps found that the first hypothesis was not supported by his data, as over 97% of sites in the subset of national libraries researched included at least one meta tag. However, Phelps found less evidence to support the idea that Dublin Core had been broadly adopted online. Approximately 10% of all sites surveyed for the study employed at least seven Dublin Core elements, and 15% of national libraries used at least eight Dublin Core elements. The elements that tended to be used the most were title, creator, and date, while those that were used the least were contributor, source, and relation. Ultimately, Phelps found that, quote, the main libraries of the world, like other website creators, have not wholeheartedly embraced Dublin Core metadata as the means to tame the internet. Finally, I'd like to point out some of the strengths and weaknesses of Dublin Core as a metadata system. It's important to note that there have been many changes to the Dublin Core system since its creation in the 90s. That said, we can make a few general points about the advantages and disadvantages the Dublin Core users have noted over the decades. First, let's consider some strengths of the Dublin Core metadata system compared to other approaches. One advantage is ease of use. The simplicity of Dublin Core means that non-catalogers, including authors and website developers, can start using Dublin Core relatively quickly. A second advantage is flexibility. Because of Dublin Core's design, including both the original 15 elements and many additional qualifiers, users can easily move from basic straightforward description of, of data to more elaborate semantics. In addition, uh, Dublin Core offers repeatability. Elements can be repeated as many times as necessary, making it easy to expand metadata description when necessary. At the same time, there are weaknesses to the Dublin Core system. First, it can be seen as oversimplistic. One criticism of Dublin Core, particularly in its early years, was a lack of elements or qualifiers suitable for describing data. This caused a loss of specificity and difficulty transferring data between metadata systems. In addition, some have criticized Dublin Core for lack of guidelines or training. Although in some ways this could be seen as part of Dublin Core's flexibility, it also meant potential for inconsistency in data input. And that ends my presentation on Dublin Core. Thank you.